Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related. Tonight on Primetime, all eyes on three school districts welcoming children back into the classroom. We have a look at the new safety measures and you'll hear from parents about why they decided to send their children back to school. And the candidates to fill Congressman John Lewis's seat started flooding in today, but whoever wins a special election may not be in Congress very long. We're breaking down the complicated process. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First tonight, a CDC report details a major COVID-19 outbreak at an overnight summer camp in North Georgia. More than 200 campers and staff tested positive after attending the YMCA's Camp High Harbor in Braben County. The report concludes the camp tried to be safe, but did not follow all guidelines strictly. Our John Shearer reports from outside the headquarters of the YMCA of Metro Atlanta with the headlines from this very detailed report. And we're working to get comment from the YMCA about the CDC report. And keep in mind, the CDC says it cannot confirm how many of those who ended up infected were infected before or after that week in camp. But here's what, they, what the CDC does say about its investigation of this outbreak. At the YMCA's Camp High Honor in Rabin County, June 21st to 27th, a teenage staff member felt sick on June 22nd and left camp the next day and then tested positive for COVID-19 on June 24th. And the camp then started sending children home that day. And a lot of adults and children ended up testing positive. Out of 597 campers and staff, 44% tested positive. 346 of them were campers and 49% of the campers ended up testing positive. Ages 6 through 10, 51% were positive. Ages 11 through 17, 44%. 18 through 21, 33%. Now, the CDC concluded that there were high attack rates among persons in all age groups, despite efforts by camp officials to implement most recommended strategies to prevent transmission. The multiple measures adopted by the camp were not sufficient to prevent an outbreak. Engaging in regular singing and cheering likely contributed to transmission. Uses of cloth masks were not universal. The CDC says staff were required to wear masks, but not children. And again, we're waiting for comment from the YMCA uh, about the prevention measure measures that were in place and how closely staffers followed them and how closely the children followed them. Now, no indications of how those who were infected are doing now or whether they ended up infecting others after that week at camp. Well, you can read the full CDC report on our story on 11alive.com and inside the 11 Alive News app. And the summer, uh, is, yeah, summer is coming to an end and children are preparing to head back to class and all eyes now are on three districts that have given parents a choice to let your kids continue learning from home or send them back into the classroom. A small school district in Jackson County has already taken the leap. Jefferson City Schools started back today. 
They serve about 3,700 students and 115 uh, faculty members. We saw bus drivers, students and staff wearing face masks during drop off hours at Jefferson Elementary and parents that we spoke with said that was a relief. My daughter was having trouble doing the virtual learning. Um, it was causing her a little bit of anxiety just being at home all the time. So I'm thankful that Jefferson has opened their doors back up. Absolutely. I would have to quit work and teach at home and it makes life very difficult, especially when my husband's overseas. We have to keep them in school. Well, I think you can practice safe distance and you can do all the right things, but children are important and I don't think they should be just kept at home. I really don't. According to the latest numbers, there are 912 total cases of COVID-19 in Jackson County, which makes 28 new counts, uh, new cases today. Almost half of these cases are from the past two weeks. 31 people have died from the virus and 91 people have been hospitalized. Monday is back to school for students in Cherokee County. Parents were able to choose whether they wanted in person or digital learning. For those parents choosing virtual, this is the last weekend to prepare. 11 Live's Brittany Klein Peters spoke with some parents who say the virtual model has left them concerned. Nobody knows what to tell their children to do Monday morning when they sit down to go to school. Nobody does. We have, I don't even have a website to tell them to log into. Parents of Cherokee County students tell me that they have been given little to no guidance on how to prepare for virtual learning. I've been getting lots of emails from the district, but they're all about the students who are going back to school, about meet and greets and, and PE uniforms and all that, but absolutely nothing is coming out for the digital students. I feel like, you know, they, they just threw it together and said, here, you know, we'll figure it out as we go. And the parents say that teachers in the public school district appear to be just as distressed about virtual learning as they are. One of my friends, her son's first grade teacher reached out to her and basically said, it, information is trickling into us. We don't know anything. We'll let you know when we do pretty much right off next week as any type of learning experience. So like, I know teachers are quitting. Wow. So yeah, so they're definitely are quitting. Um, I know they had sent out like a notification the other day saying like, you know, if a teacher takes a leave or if they resign, not to worry that they have people lined up like retired teachers or things like that. These families say they just want the district to treat virtual instruction with the same importance as in person. I just hope that they get this together. I hope that everything does go as smooth as they present it to, to be um, for the sake of all these kids. The school district told me that they have been working around the clock to prepare for the start of Monday for both in-person and virtual learning. They did decline to do an interview due to reaching out to parents directly. We have a back to school guide on 11alive.com that breaks down plans for each Metro Atlanta district and we can send it to you straight on your phone. Just text the word school to the number there on your screen. It's 404-885-7600. The 11 Live storm trackers are keeping an eye on a few showers that are out there. Most of these in West Georgia are dying out, but we have some in North Georgia and Northeast Georgia that are holding together with a lot of rain and lightning with those. Let's start off first. You can see this in West Georgia as that system that we were watching coming out of Alabama. We were expecting it to weaken, but and it did weaken. There was just a few showers coming in here to West Georgia, so no bad storms coming through. Some of these were pretty heavy coming into Heard County, but those are all falling apart. In Atlanta, we are fine right now. Now, though, north and east of the city, look up 85 once you get past Jackson County and into parts of Franklin County. Really heavy rain and thunder and lightning right there with that area just to the south of Tacoa. In fact, we've got a lot of lightning, some of this getting closer to Lake Hartwell. About 35 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. There's another cluster that we're watching right up here on the Gilmer and Fannin County line. That has some really heavy rain with it, thunder and lightning with that as well. In matter of fact, take a look at this on the bigger picture, and you can see this is our live camera there 
there in Blue Ridge up in North Georgia. And that's where I just showed you on radio some on radar. Some of that heavier rain that's coming down and that's evidenced here uh, by what we're seeing here on this live video coming in from or live camera coming in from the Blue Ridge area. We're also keeping a close eye on what is going on right now with Hurricane Isaias and maximum sustained winds now are up a little bit to 80 miles an hour as it's moving over the Bahamas. It's going to be headed into South Florida. Once we go through the weekend, we do have some hurricane warnings in effect for parts of the Atlantic coast of Florida. Stay with us. We're going to show you that updated forecast track in just a few minutes. Chris, thank you. The special election to fill the late Congressman John Lewis's seat in Washington is only 60 days away. Candidates needed to qualify by 1 p.m. today and seven people have signed up. Joe Hinkey has more on the candidates. For voters in Georgia's 5th district, this might be a little bit confusing as there are currently two separate elections scheduled to fill Representative John Lewis's seat. There's a general election scheduled for November. The winner of that election will serve a full two year term. But first, there's a special election scheduled for September. The winner of that race will finish John Lewis's term, which is scheduled to expire in January. And here are the seven candidates who qualified to run in the 5th District special election. Former Morehouse President Robert Franklin, former Atlanta City Council member Kwanzaa Hall, Barrington Martin II, who ran against Lewis in the 5th District primary earlier this year, coming in second with more than 20,000 votes. Also qualifying are Atlanta Minister Stephen Muhammad, Libertarian Chase Oliver, current State House Representative Abel Mabel Thomas, and former State House Rep Keisha Waits. The winner will be the first person other than John Lewis representing Georgia's 5th District since 1987. We reached out to all seven candidates today and asked about filling the seat of a civil rights icon. Three candidates were available for interviews. I'm humble. I'm, hum I'm very humbled. I understand that those are big shoes to fill, but I think that it's important for the person to fill those shoes. Um, you know, personifies what Congressman Lewis has personified, the, the courageousness, the fearlessness. I think it's an honor uh, because of the work that he did um, as a civil rights hero. And I will say that during this time when we've had information given, literally we found out more that he did than we even knew. I, of course, respect and understand that this is a, a very revered seat to be uh, running for. And um, I'm doing so with the hopes that I can continue the, uh, the legacy of fighting for freedom and liberty that John Lewis uh, spoke about throughout his entire life. Voters will potentially be asked to head to the polls in the 5th District three times before the end of the year. A special election on September 29th will feature the candidates who qualified today. If needed, a runoff will take place on December 1st. The eventual winner will fill Lewis's seat until January 2nd when his term expires. And on November 3rd, voters can choose between Democrat State Senator Nakima Williams or Republican Angela Stanton King. The winner of this vote will serve a full two-year term starting in January. Well, we have details on each candidate now running in the special election for Georgia's 5th District on 11alive.com. You can also look for this story inside the 11 Alive app. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation there in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in prime time after this break. Through your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice. Georgia's coronavirus restrictions expire at midnight. The last time this order was set to expire earlier this month, Governor Kemp extended it, but he has yet to say if he will do that again. Some of the restrictions that could be lifted by tomorrow are a ban on gatherings of more than 50 people in public places. The order also called for people considered high risk for the virus to shelter in place that could expire. The order allowed school boards to require face masks and force social distancing during athletic, musical, or other educational activities while also reducing class sizes. Lastly, Kemp's, ex Kemp's executive order shut down local mask mandates that were more restrictive than the state's rules. Experts say pregnant mothers are more likely to become hospitalized if they are infected with COVID-19. So what should expecting mothers do if they catch coronavirus before or after their delivery? Reveal investigator Andy Parati spoke with an Emory doctor and a mom about what it's like to be pregnant during a pandemic. We know it's a girl, so it's really fun. Sally King Benedict looks forward to meeting her future daughter. She stayed healthy during her pregnancy so far, but the Atlanta artist is nervous about catching COVID-19. It's just scary. You have to let go of that anxiety and just kind of keep telling yourself, okay, the baby, you know, the baby's healthy. I'm going to stay as healthy as possible. While pregnant moms are not more likely to contract the virus, their symptoms can turn more severe. Denise Jamison is an obstetrician and chairs Emory University's Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. So there's some information that pregnant women with COVID are more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to need intensive care. So it's another reason why it's really important that pregnant women take all measures possible to avoid getting COVID. According to the Georgia Department of Public Health, at least 696 newborns have contracted the virus 37 hospitalized, none have died. If a mother does contract COVID, Dr. Jamison says evidence shows most babies should not be separated from their mothers. And that's really important because we know that early bonding of babies and their mothers is really important and early breastfeeding is really important. Benedict wears masks and stays away from crowds, just as doctors recommend. So there will be no baby shower. Her biggest concern is not having the family support she needs after giving birth. That will be very tough um, if, if people are not able to, you know, be in our home and sort of, it requires a village, I need help. There is evidence mothers can pass along COVID-19 to their unborn children, but Dr. Jamison believes that's rare. And for the babies who do get sick, Doctors don't know about potential long-term effects because scientists are still learning about the virus. All the more reason doctors say that pregnant women should try to avoid getting this virus. Back a couple of those clusters of heavy rain showers and thunderstorm activity. We've got two of those that we're watching one up in far north Georgia in Fannin County and parts of Gilmer County that's about to move into Union County with some really heavy rain and thunder and lightning. Also, we've been tracking some of these north and east of the city up 85 north. That's getting closer to the South Carolina line, but we still have some really heavy rain and thunder and lightning right there in Franklin County. That's near Cannon. This moved over uh, Hall County just a little bit earlier into parts of Banks County, Jackson County. County. Now it's over Franklin County, getting closer to Lake Hartwell. Uh, the main threats with this really heavy rain and some thunder and lightning. In fact, we have about 69 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes just in this one cluster of showers and thunderstorms. And then another one that's been moving through Fannin and Gilmer County with some really heavy rain, thunder and lightning with that about to move into Union County as well as into parts of Lumpkin County here, uh, and that should be weakening as it moves over to the north and east, and right now we have about 34 lightning strikes in that cell. Here elsewhere in West Georgia, we've watching, been watching those showers and storms coming out of Alabama that produced severe weather back in Birmingham. We were expecting these to weaken coming into West Georgia, and that's exactly what's happening. Still some light rain through parts of northwest Georgia. Nothing major here out west in Carroll County. Heard County, you had some showers and storms earlier. Here in Atlanta, we're fine right now. We've just had a couple of 
spotty showers that have been moving through the area. Take a look out there right now and you can see what we're watching. This is our live camera. This is in Blue Ridge and you can see the clouds in association with some of the rain and storms that have been moving through there and the roads are wet from the showers that moved through just a little while ago. That's now pushing to the east of Blue Ridge and into parts of Union County. Here's a look at Hurricane Isaias and this storm is right over the Bahamas right now, continuing to move up toward the north and east. We have new data in right now from the 8 o'clock advisory from the National Hurricane Center. Winds are now up to 80 miles an hour. Storms moving northwest at 15 miles an hour. Here's the track of the system. During the day tomorrow, it's going to be moving around the Bahamas and approaching uh, southeastern parts of Florida. There is a hurricane warning in effect for parts of the Atlantic coast of Florida as the system moves in. The track has been kind of wavering a little bit from, uh, from west to east. Now it's pretty much skirting the Florida coastline. During the day on Sunday is when they'll be feeling most of the impacts. Then it moves up to the north, becomes a tropical storm, and kind of curves around the coast of Georgia. That's when Monday the Georgia coast will be feeling most of the impacts. Right now we think it'll be breezy conditions, rough surf and some rain along the Georgia coast. But based on this track, you can see it racing up through the Carolinas as well and then up to the northeast by Wednesday. Based on this track, we're on the quiet side of the system and I do think that we'll have a few showers possible uh, during the day on Monday, especially in East Georgia. Here's a look at the winds. Now if you're concerned about uh, the wind here along the Georgia coast, this is what we're watching during the day on Monday. There will be along the coastline 20 to 30 mile an hour winds, but that doesn't extend back into much of the state of Georgia at all. So we're not worried about any windy conditions here at all. Just maybe a little better chance for some showers on Monday, especially over in East Georgia. Right now we're 88. We got up to 92 for a high today. Athens is also at 88. Those areas of North Georgia where we've had rain, that's where those temperatures are a little bit cooler. 77 in Rome right now. Here's a look at these temperatures tonight moving down into the 70s overnight. It's going to be a mild start. We get up to 92 tomorrow and 8 on the wasometer, only a 20% chance for an isolated shower tomorrow. Some drier air is moving in here. 30% chance for showers on Sunday. And then Monday, we're back up to a 40% chance for some showers. Again, that's all dependent on the track of that system that's off of the Atlantic coastline. And then 20% uh, chance Wednesday and Thursday, back to a 30% Friday. Each day highs in the upper 80s to near 90. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions.
almost a full week of tributes for Congressman John Lewis from Alabama to Washington, D.C., then ending here in Atlanta on Thursday with the celebration of his life. Joining me now is Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press. The funeral service for Congressman Lewis, very memorable, including the eulogy by former President Obama, where he brought up something near and dear to Congressman Lewis's heart, and that's voting and voting rights. And what sort of impact do you think that will have on this in Congress? Jeff, I think the the I think it had even more impact by because of what happened earlier in the day. I mean, of, of all days for President Trump to float this trial balloon of delaying the election, uh, he chose the day of John Lewis's funeral. Right, a man who spent his whole life trying to expand the ability of people to participate in a democracy. Um, it, it, you know, I would love to know this. Put it this way, Jeff. I would love to know whether the draft of the eulogy that President Obama wrote the night before President Trump's tweet had the words George Wallace or Bull Connor in it. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe it had Bull Connor, but I wonder on George Wallace, right? And because it felt as if it almost had more of an impact both on President Obama. I mean, he was, he was as fired up on something as I've seen in a while. And I think it, it is one of those, did President Trump just sort of awake a sleeping asset of Joe Biden's, right? Um, and I'll say this, I don't you're going to see the Voting Rights Act voted on this year. I do think very early next year you will, particularly if there's uh, a change. And it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up being hugely bipartisan, um, say, even, say, if the Democrats are in control. Now, if the Republicans keep control of the Senate, maybe you won't get it. But if the Democrats get control and it gets introduced, it wouldn't shock me if one of the co-sponsors is a guy named Mitch McConnell. The, the exit of John Lewis is such nationally, is so enormous. But, but here in Atlanta, where he was a city councilman, where he would be seen at Braves games back in the early 1970s with, with sacks of hot dogs for his godson, Michael Julian Bond, mm -hmm. who's now an Atlanta city councilman, <laughs> is such, such a figure here of, of, of being seen everywhere in the community, whether it's in a, a Kroger at night buying groceries. He was just one of those legends that you could see and touch and speak to and have your picture taken with. It's funny you say that. It, yes, an accessible giant, right? We're so used to being people who are giants, uh, who are icons, and you don't get to touch them or see them. They're on statues or on monuments or they're behind a motorcade or they're behind a velvet rope. And, like, you know, I can't believe people like you and I, Jeff, have gotten interview him multiple times because he's very accessible. Um, no matter who you were, you know, no offense to any of us, we, we weren't special, but he, he, he sort of treated everybody the same, and in that sense, he treated them really well, right? And that's why he, I think, came across so successful. It's also why there was a bipartisan outpouring, even if there wasn't always bipartisan support for his ideas. Yeah, you, because you, of, of, of how he, he saw the best in everybody, even if we didn't see that. You're, you're absolutely right about John Lewis. I mean, I did charity events with him back into the early to mid-1980s with him, uh, you know, appearing with him at, at Braves games or with the Braves when they were at the White House with President Clinton after winning the World Championship. I mean, he was just always accessible. Right. He was always seen in the community. And, and the likes of those kinds of men and women, quite frankly, um, I, I don't believe we're going to see again. And, and we're worse for that fact. Also, I wanted to bring up very quickly uh, Herman Cain, another Atlanta man, a huge following, who died yesterday. Yeah. A, a a, a remarkable life. His father began as the chauffeur for Robert W. Woodruff, the Coca-Cola czar and, and chief of Atlanta, and and this amazing right. life here, and opted to go conservative, which certainly has stirred a lot of pots, not only here in Atlanta, but, but around the country as well. Just a, a life of impact. <laughs> Look, he's a dynamic uh, figure in both in the business world and in the political world. A, 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 you know, as CEO of Godfathers, head of the National Restaurant Association, was on the Federal Reserve. I mean, a, a very accomplished figure. And I think sometimes, I think too many people uh, outside of Atlanta, I think only saw him and remember him if they remember him as, oh, he's that 999 guy, you know, from the 2012 campaign. But but he, he lived a very full life, a very impressive life. I do think his political, his short-lived presidential campaign was was to me, one of the first clues that, boy, there was a hunger in the Republican Party for something different. Don't yeah. give me the same cookie-cutter candidates. And so 
you know, that early rise of Herman Cain in 2012, I think in hindsight, was foreshadowing the eventual rise of Donald Trump. Yeah, absolutely. Chuck, thank you. Appreciate the insight. Meet the Press airs Sunday morning at 10, right here on 11 Alive. Have a great weekend, Chuck. Right, See you soon. Five. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. This is a day thousands of Georgians have been dreading as they struggle through the economic crisis caused by this COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the $600 federal unemployment benefit expires. Yesterday, negotiations in Congress for a new relief package completely broke down. This is all happening as the United States reports more Americans are filing for first time unemployment benefits. Republicans had proposed cutting the federal benefits to $200 a week, but Democrats wouldn't agree. The White House says Democrats also rejected a one week extension. Meanwhile, Democrats say that they want a more comprehensive extension with money for schools and testing and aid to state and local governments. The situation is also dire for small businesses that have thrived for generations in Atlanta's West End and Castleberry here Hill communities. Several are facing the prospect now of shutting down for good. But as 11 Alive's bill list reports, there is still time to get the financial help that they need. For predominantly African-American-owned small businesses on Atlanta's West End and in Castleberry Hill, COVID-19 is dealing a serious blow. The situation is very grim. And George Andrews of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank is not alone. Jason Clifton, president of the West End Merchants Coalition, shares the same view. In the Castleberry West End area, um, I would estimate we should we should see 50, 60 percent of the small businesses in that area to go under. And that's what happened to small business owner Yolanda Owens. She owns Iwi Fresh, a spa and beauty business in Castleberry Hill. She got turned down once for an SBA loan and was forced to cut her staff by almost half 
and stop in walk in business she finally got a small loan but says her business which has been operating here for thirteen years is now in jeopardy the main concern was paying our rent paying my staff uh, we were not i was not able to pay my staff the ppp we got was not enough we need more and we are in danger of shutting down it's a story that andrews and clifton say they hear day after day but there is encouraging news the sba's paycheck protection program will be extended through august the 8th so there's still time for small businesses to apply and the economic disaster relief program is in effect until the end of the year you can also apply for that and there is strong community support for other solutions we need a bailout and this bailout should be in the, in for, in the form of grants in the form of no interest loans repaid back over a long period of time also proposed the targeted fund aimed directly at small business all with one goal keep the doors open through COVID-19 for small business in the West End and in Castleberry Hill. 11alive.com uh, has several helpful links on how to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Relief Program as well. Still watching some of those showers and storms that are over in uh, East Georgia, north and east of the city, and also in North Georgia. We're fine here in Atlanta, and the showers that have been coming in from Alabama and West Georgia are really falling apart. Still a little bit of light rain with that, but these to the north and east of us still with some really heavy rain. This has been traveling up 85. It was over 985 earlier in North Hall, and that activity is pushing up to Tacoa. But then we had this developing along 85 in parts of Banks County, also into uh, Franklin County, and moving up into parts of St the uh, Stevens County. County area near Tacoa and also near Elberton and Hart County near Lake Hartwell where we have some really heavy rain and a lot of lightning. Now the lightning count has come down a little bit. If you were with us earlier we had about 64 lightning strikes. That's now down to around 30 plus lightning strikes. We have more showers and storms here coming out of Fanning County moving into Union County. The northern parts of Lumpkin County with some heavy rain thunder and lightning. That's going to keep moving to the east and weakening also as it moves to the east. And then these lighter showers over in West Georgia and Northwest Georgia we had thunder and lightning with these earlier, but they are much lighter out there right now. Some of these on the west side, light rain in Douglas County, parts of Carroll County, also here in Atlanta. We're fine, and we might see just a couple little spotty showers late tonight, but for the most part, most of us are going to be dry. Here's another live look out there right now. This is the view up in the Blue Ridge area where the, uh, the streets are dry, are, are actually wet right now from some of the rain that came through earlier, but now that heavy rain has pushed out of Blue Ridge, moving over into Union County. Stay with us. We'll let you know when additional showers will be developing here uh, and if we'll see those rain chances going down into the weekend. All right, Chris, thank you. The South Florida coast is prepping for that hurricane. Chris has been tracking for us and there is an added complication. The state still dealing with a record number of COVID-19 cases. NBC's Chris Ballone has more on how this might impact the response. In Florida, the clock is ticking. They just signed an executive order uh, to declare a state of emergency in every coastal county of Florida's east coast. Hurricane Isaias is on the way, now projected to skirt the entire length of the Sunshine State's east coast. But wary experts know a change in that track by just a few miles west can turn a gentle storm into a major disaster. As a mayor, I lose sleep over flooding. In Florida's coastal cities, people are wasting no time preparing for this storm and the peak of hurricane season yet to come. I think people are really trying to get ready in case something happens. Isaias caused flooding across Puerto Rico Thursday as a tropical storm. It strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane just before midnight after spending days as a disorganized system out at sea. The problem with this storm is there's only two days notification. Most have a week. As one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots, a major hurricane could pose a dual threat both to public health and homes and businesses. State COVID-19 testing centers have been temporarily shut down. The situation remains fluid and can change quickly. Hurricane season during a global pandemic, a test of wills and of the government's ability to keep people safe. One of the biggest struggles of transitioning to virtual learning is internet access. Some families don't have an internet connection or a laptop, and if they do, they may not have one for each school age child that is now learning from home. School districts across the metro are trying to ease that burden, and as Christy Diaz reports, they're having to get creative. 
Welcome to the classroom of the 2020 pandemic. 100% virtual. Marietta City Schools, Atlanta Public Schools, and DeKalb County Schools are just three of the districts going all virtual into the new school year. A decision most can agree is not ideal. It takes a lot. I think many of us have learned that to sit for a while and talk to a device. We miss human interaction. On top of that, the FCC reports 25 million Americans lack access to a broadband connection. You can't have a device and not have the basic Wi-Fi, right? And if your Wi-Fi is interrupted every five to 10 minutes, how effective is that engagement? We had a family pull up uh, to the school building who had five children, and she said, I've got two laptops, but can I get three more? And I think I need another hotspot. And literally, we're just trying to meet the unique needs of our children. So therefore, they don't fall through the cracks of this pandemic. Districts are doing everything they can to remove at least that hurdle from this new way of life. APS handing out six to 10,000 devices and hotspots. DeKalb buying Chromebooks and Marietta City Schools gathering supplies from three different vendors to get the 700 hotspots they needed. And they're about to buy 100 more. We had to literally cobble together. We got all the hotspots back from seniors. We're prepared to give them to kindergartners. In May, 448 internet-enabled school buses were deployed to 36 rural counties. Thanks to a five-month service donation, these buses will continue to provide Wi-Fi bubbles in areas of highest need at the start of the school year. Marietta also using this strategy and says not only has it allowed them to keep paying their drivers, it enhances connection far beyond what the internet can provide. Literally every day on the same exact routes, the kids would lay a blanket in the front yard and just be able to wave to the bus driver and wave to a neighbor. It's just our effort to try to keep a sense of community and obviously our effort to keep a sense of connectivity. Well, the state is hoping that $6 million in CARES Act funding will help schools get to where they need to be. The money, the money will be used to buy things like those Wi-Fi transmitters on school buses you just heard about and other connectivity solutions. If your family has a need for a device or an internet hotspot, we've posted several links to resources on our website and the addresses to where those buses will be parked in Marietta. You can find it all on 11alive.com. We also have a back to school guide there that breaks down plans for each Metro Atlanta school district. We can also send it straight to your cell phone. Just text the word school to the number there on your screen. It's 404-885-7600. $7. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for 90. Many countries around the world are banning U.S. travelers as our COVID-19 cases rise and Americans who are already abroad are having trouble getting back home. One local mother is battling cancer all while trying to care for her son with Down syndrome while her daughter is stranded in India. Our Elwin Lopez spoke with the family today. My body and the condition that it's in. I could go anytime, but I would like to see Sarah before I go. Not only is Lisa Robbins at a high risk for COVID-19, but she also has cancer, suffers from several autoimmune diseases. She is bedridden and her greatest fear is not seeing her daughter Sarah again. I need her here if I want to survive everything that I'm going through. Sarah traveled to India for work back in October, but has been stranded since March. That's when India first closed its borders due to the pandemic. According to the State Department website, as of June, there have been 45 repatriation flights out of India. United Airlines has also resumed some flights to the U.S. through the end of July. But Sarah says every time she tries to come home, she runs into an obstacle. Every single one was unavailable, unavailable, unavailable. While there are ways out of India through KLM, Air France, and Lufthansa, they are mostly to Europe. Sarah worries getting on one of these flights might lead her to being stranded yet again, but this time with zero help. Even if I get on a flight to one of these other countries, a lot of countries now are banning travel either outside of their country at all or specifically to the U.S. Unable to come home to take care of her mother, her brother, who has Down syndrome, will also be left without a caregiver. Now, after months of failed attempts, Sarah says she sees no light at the end of the tunnel and worries she won't make it home anytime soon. Even without a virus, something could happen to her. She already could possibly not survive. And so my greatest fear is something happening to her while I'm still in India. Sarah says while there are some seemingly available flights online, when she schedules these, these are later canceled. Now, this is all due to the evolving pandemic. We have reached out to the U.S. Embassy in Kolkata, India, but have not heard back yet. We have pretty quiet weather around here now in Metro Atlanta, still watching a few showers north and west of the city and the main areas of rain still with some thunder and lightning are north and east of us up 85 as you get closer to the South Carolina line. This is where we have that really heavy rain that's moving through parts of Franklin County over about to cross over Lake Hartwell and we do have some lightning with that. So hopefully everyone is off the lake and then it extends down to the south a little bit with additional lightning down in these areas and the lightning count is still pretty impressive just in in this small area that we see right now, we've got about 43 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, and that's as you get around the Royston area and just south of Royston, where we have most of that lightning that's moving through and still watching these showers and storms up in North Georgia. We had heavy rain that came through Blue Ridge earlier in parts of Fannin County. This is now crossing over to Union County near Hiawassee, and that's going to push into Towns County in just a little, little bit near Hiawassee uh, in those areas. Most of the lightning has now extended over the state line right there on the Tennessee and North Carolina line right there uh, moving into Clay County. This is in North Carolina. We've got about 28 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes there and that's going to keep moving up toward the north. Then in West Georgia, the storms we were tracking coming out of Alabama. See all that lightning with that? That all just pretty much fell apart as it was pushing into Georgia. Still some light rain over parts of Northwest Georgia. Some of that trying to push into Cleburne County right there to Harrelson and and uh, and, uh, and Polk County as well in West Georgia. And then all of these little light showers, a little bit left of that in Douglas County. That's all starting to fall apart as well. In Atlanta, 
we're looking good. And I think for tonight, most of us will be dry. There just might be a couple of sprinkles around here and there. Here's another live look at what we're watching. This is at that tower cam still in Blue Ridge. Uh, wanting to show you that as those heavier rain showers move through a little bit earlier, but you can see how the roads are wet in Blue Ridge, but the rain is now out of the Blue Ridge area. Now I want you to see here, look at the temperatures before I overlay them where we see the orange colors. That's still where, where it's really warm. Where we've had the rain in North Georgia, you see the yellow colors here and in West Georgia, that's where the rain cooled air has cooled things off. It's 76 in Carrollton, 77 in Rome, 79 up in Dalton, whereas in these areas where we did not get any rain right now, it's 88 in Atlanta. Here we are at the almost nine o'clock hour, 88 over in Athens as well. We hit 92 for our high today, and I do think we'll hit 92 again tomorrow. We're going to go with an eight on the wasometer, and if you're waiting for a break in the rain, I do think that many of us will get a break in the rain tomorrow with only a 20% chance for a shower. You can see this moisture moving through tonight as it exits and gets out of here. We're going to be dry in the morning. Some sunshine really going to be a nice start to the day. Still warm and muggy, but the absence of those afternoon showers developing only a 20% chance at a late afternoon, early evening shower developing. You can see just some of those green uh, blips on the radar there, just showing just that isolated shower that could pop up here and there. On Sunday, we do go back up to a 30% chance for showers in the afternoon hours. And of course, we're watching on Monday as uh, the system, Hurricane uh, e e I See, I was just talking with somebody here in the Weather Center about it. Isaias, no matter how many times I practice it, I still stumble over it. You can see the center of the storm here on Monday, bringing that rain into the Georgia coast. Maybe a couple of showers as far back into metro Atlanta with that rain chance just up to about 40% here on your Monday. And then as we get into Tuesday, rain chance back down to 30%. Lower rain chances Wednesday and Thursday, back to a 30% chance Friday with high temperatures each day in the upper 80s to around 90 degrees. All right, Chris, thank you. Well, when should you mail in your ballot to make sure your voice is counted? Viral claims say it has to be two weeks before the election, and in the case of November's election, that would mean October 20th. But our Verify team find that you need to mark a different date on your calendar. Here's Jason Puckett. Let's start with the viral posts. Chrissy Teigen and others shared this message claiming the U.S. Postal Service is telling Americans to give 14 days travel time for mail-in ballots to be counted. Quote, Election Day is not November 3rd. Election Day is Tuesday, October 20th. To see if this claim was true, we went straight to the United States Postal Service. They pointed out that different states have different due dates for mail-in ballots. Most say ballots need to be received by the end of Election Day, November 3rd. Others, like Illinois and North Carolina, only require postmarks by election. Election Day, and then others like Louisiana actually require ballots to be received the day before Election Day. Now, sites like USA.gov and Vote.org have specific dates for each state. The USPS told us they, quote, recommend that domestic non-military voters mail their ballots at least one week prior to their state's due date. That's seven days, not 14. So is the claim correct? Do I have to send my ballot 14 days before that due date? No, this claim is false. A reminder, you can also drop the ballots off in person at your election office. Still ahead in primetime, calls for justice in Breonna Taylor's case have led to new rules in the city of South Fulton. We're going through the new restrictions for officers serving warrants. We'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. 
Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to... The city of South Fulton has decided to put limits on no-knock warrants. The move is in honor of Brianna Taylor, a young woman killed by police in March inside her home in Louisville. Officers were able to get into her apartment under the authority of a no-knock warrant. Now her family says her boyfriend started shooting because he thought they were intruders. Taylor was shot multiple times. Her death has led to continued protest across the country, including here in Metro Atlanta, with calls to arrest the officers involved. And while the city of South Fulton has never carried out a no-knock warrant, the city says that there needs to be clear guidance. Any no-knock warrant has to be signed by the police chief before being sent off for a judge's approval. And this new rule says when serving a warrant, officers have to knock loud enough to be heard inside and wait at least 15 seconds before entering someone's home. We reached out to other metro area police departments to get their policies on no-knock warrants. You can find our responses that we received from Cobb and Gwinnett County inside this story on 11alive.com. Well, it is a political ad that you have probably seen right here on 11 Alive. President Trump calling former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, claiming rather that his that he supports defunding the police and that that support could lead to longer response times. Well, we're going to separate fact from fiction ahead in prime time. Information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon, there's a growing call to replace a statue of a Confederate leader from Georgia with one honoring the late Congressman John Lewis. Each state is allowed to display two statues of notable citizens in the United States Capitol. One of Georgia's in the National Statuary Hall depicts Governor and Congressman a Alexander Hamilton Stevens, who also served as the vice president of the Confederacy. Now members of Georgia's congressional delegation are asking it to be replaced with one of the late John Lewis. In letters asking Governor Kemp, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, and House Speaker David Ralston to approve the measure, the lawmakers write, quote, there is no Georgian more worthy of this great honor than John Lewis, who symbolizes for us not only what Georgia once was, but what it can and should be. In order to replace the statue, the state legislature must pass a resolution which the governor would then need to approve. Governor Kemp has already signaled his support, tweeting Wednesday, by putting Lewis's statue in the U.S. Capitol, we can celebrate his legacy of service for years to come. All right, Jay Bell, straight ahead on primetime. Coronavirus cases still surging in Georgia as we speak, with Fulton County leading the state. And we're going to take a closer look at how they're actually handling the virus. And from zero to seven in a matter of hours tonight, we look at the field of candidates competing to fill Congressman John Lewis's seat on Capitol Hill. Briefly. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. All right, folks, we're going to begin tonight with an explosion of COVID infections at a North Georgia summer camp. It just released a report from the CDC that says more than 200 campers and staff members tested positive after attending the YMCA's Camp High Harbor in Rabin County. So as John Sherrick reports tonight, there is much left unsaid about how they got infected and how they're doing now. And the CDC says there is no way to find out exactly how many campers and staffers were And the CDC says there is no way to find out exactly how many campers and staffers were infected before, during, or after that week of camp last month, or how everyone's doing now. But here's what the CDC report does say. Within days after Camp High Harbor in Rabin County opened to campers last month on June 21st, one teenage staffer felt sick, then tested positive. And then on June 24th, the camp sent everyone home. Then hundreds ended up testing positive. One common link among all the cases is that camp. The CDC says the camp tried to observe all safety precautions, but did not follow them strictly, and children were not required to wear masks. According to the CDC, out of 597 campers and staff, 44% tested positive. 346 of them were campers, and 49% of the campers ended up testing positive. By age group, ages 6 through 10, 51% were positive. Ages 11 through 17, 44% were positive. Ages 18 through 21, 33 percent. The CDC concluded that those that there were high attack rates among persons in all age groups, despite efforts by camp officials to implement most recommended strategies to prevent transmission. The multiple measures ex adopted by the camp were not sufficient to prevent an outbreak. Engaging in regular singing and cheering likely contributed to transmission. Use of cloth masks was not universal. The CDC cannot definitively link all the cases to that summer camp, but is saying that that one link that they do know about is that out of all the people who are at the camp, more than 250 of them tested positive. 
All right, thanks a lot, John. So here's what the YMCA is saying tonight. Um, the officials had to say in a statement late this evening, they tell 11 Alive that they made every effort at Camp High Harbor to adhere to CDC and state guidelines. The statement goes on to say that the counselor who tested positive while at the camp passed mandated safety protocols, including proving a negative COVID-19 test before camp actually began. And you can read more on that statement on our website at 11alive.com. Well, the number of COVID-19 related deaths took another jump today with 81 deaths reported. Now this comes as a state announcing 4,066 new COVID-19 cases. Gwinnett had the, the largest increase with 419 new cases. Fulton was second with 360 new cases. Now, and despite the numbers, right now, Fulton County leads the state as the county with the most COVID-19 cases. It's not surprising here, folks, since Fulton has the largest population. Still, Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom says there's a growing concern about COVID's reach well beyond the cases reported. Cases and deaths, those are the two data points Fulton County's public health director says guides everything she does each day. Because if we didn't have cases, then we, all the rest of it is, is irrelevant. To find those cases, the county has more than tripled the number of tests conducted. In June, it collected an average of 936 samples each day. In July, that jumped to an average of 2,700. As you'd expect, cases are going up as well, but at a faster rate. From an average of 61 each day in June to 313 this past week. But I just do want to stress that this uptick in infections and case counts is not simply due to an increase in testing. It's, it's, it's actual increased transmission. Dr. Lynn Paxton says it's the people coming in for tests simply because their employer or summer camp requires it that's helped them learn more about asymptomatic spread. 26% of those that showed up for a test in Fulton had no idea they were infected. That's where contact tracing has become so important. As soon as we receive notification through the electronic notification system that comes directly from the laboratories, an investigator is assigned to, um, to call. Fulton has about 80 people to make those calls, but they aren't always answered. Please pick it up because we generally have good information. We, we have information you want to know. Like a program the county is working on to help people who really should stay home and self-isolate but feel like they can't because of child care or financial concerns. The goal, fewer cases, which means fewer hospitalizations. In the past week, 152 residents have been hospitalized. 27 have died. The health region that includes Fulton County says it has 15% of its ICU beds available. And that's better than a lot of regions, in part because Piedmont opened its new COVID unit on Sunday. That has created and staffed 60 more beds in Atlanta, but Dr. Paxton hopes most never have to be used. Wear a mask. How many times do I have to tell people that? All right, folks, we got some breaking news right now. Governor Brian Kemp has extended Georgia's COVID-19 state of emergency that was set to expire in just a few hours. The governor is also renewing COVID-19 restrictions that include limiting gatherings to 50 people or fewer and requiring those at highest risk of contracting the virus to shelter in place. And of course, you're gonna find a lot more on the coronavirus and the steps that Georgia is taking in all those communities and, and trying to lower the curve, crush that curve. It's on our website at 11alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Live Storm Trackers, where we have dry weather here in Atlanta, and things are starting to dry out over North Georgia in those spots that did have some of the isolated showers that moved through just a little bit earlier. You can see some of those still lingering up here in East Georgia, and then a few right there on the Georgia and North Carolina line. That's where we had some heavy rain and thunder and lightning in the North Georgia mountains. Let's start off first up 85 as you get closer to, to Lake Hartwell, right there on the South Carolina and Georgia line. You can see a few of these showers, a little bit of lightning near Reed Creek right there at Lake Hartwell. The heaviest rain is around Royston and just to the south of Royston, really between Royston and Comer, where we have this cluster of heavy rain with thunder and lightning. That continues to move over toward the east. That'll be passing through and going out through Elbert County in just a little while and over into South Carolina in just a little bit. The lightning count with that is starting to come down just a little bit, so that's showing us that that cell is weakening somewhat. Also, in North Georgia, this was really heavy rain in parts of Gilmer, Fannin County, the 
northern parts of Lumpkin County. Most of that really heavy stuff is over Clay County in North Carolina and over the line into North Carolina where we have most of the lightning. Some of that lightning though still extends down into parts of Towns County at this hour. A little bit of rain developing there on the line uh, between Lumpkin County and White County. Moderate rain. We're not seeing any lightning with that either. And then all of the rain that's been over in Alabama coming into West Georgia. The trend is that that is falling apart and we'll continue to see that just light rain falling apart as it continues to move on over to the east. Here's another live look out there right now. You can see what we're watching again close to Atlanta. A few of those showers over on the west side, but nothing inside the perimeter at this hour. Here's that live camera. This is in Rome as we're looking down on the streets a little damp from some of those showers that were moving through Floyd County a little bit earlier, but right now things are beginning to dry out somewhat. Stay with us. We're going to take a look at these temperatures and you can see the spots where the rain was falling where we have that rain cooled air, but Atlanta eastward still really warm at this late night hour. We'll talk more about that and give you the latest on Hurricane Isaias in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, we will see you in a couple of minutes. Well, the ballot is now set for the special election to finish Congressman John Lewis's current term in Washington, D.C. Candidates needed to qualify by this afternoon. 11 Alive's Joe Hinkey has a look at the candidates and the reason 5th District voters may need to head to the polls up to three times. Seven candidates qualified today for the special election in Georgia's 5th District. The winner of that election will take over John Lewis's seat and finish his term set to expire in January. Meanwhile, voters are also being asked to consider two separate candidates. That will take place in a general election in November with the winner of that taking over the district for the next two years. Nobody but John Lewis has represented Georgia's 5th District since 1987, but seven candidates are now squaring off to complete the civil rights leader's current term. On the ballot will be Democrat and former Morehouse President Robert Franklin, Democrat and former Atlanta City Council Member Kwanza Hall, Barrington Martin II, a Democrat who ran against Lewis in the 5th District primary earlier this year, coming in second with more than 20,000 votes. Also qualifying, Atlanta Minister Stephen Muhammad, an independent candidate, Libertarian Chase Oliver, current Democratic State House Representative Abel Mabel Thomas, and former State House Rep Democrat Keisha Waits. Voters will choose between the seven during a September 29th special election. If needed, a runoff will be held on December 1st. The winner will leave office on January 2nd, so they may serve only a matter of weeks. Between those two dates is the November 3rd general election. That is when Democrat State Senator Nakima Williams and Republican Angela Stanton King will be on the ballot. They are competing to represent the 5th District in D.C. for a full two years. All right, so this is a political ad you no doubt have heard several times over the past few weeks, especially right here on 11 Alive and the other networks around our area. Um, President Trump's campaign claiming presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden supports defunding police departments across the country. But is that really true? Jennifer Bellamy verifies. The ad begins with an elderly woman hearing a burglar breaking in. She tries to call 911, but instead of someone picking up, there's a recorded message. Oh, you've reached 911. I'm sorry that there is no one here to answer your emergency call. We've received several emails from viewers questioning the claims in this 30-second ad by the Trump 2020 campaign, like this one. Joe Biden said he's absolutely on board with defunding the police. The on-screen text, however, quotes a headline saying the Democratic nominee wants to reduce police funding. The distinction in what you hear versus what you read in the ad is important, as Biden has been pretty clear on record concerning his stance on this. Let's take a look at the sources given in this ad. Joe Biden remarks July 8th. That likely comes from this interview posted on that date with activist Addie Barkin with the digital media site Now This News. Do we agree that we can redirect some of the funding? Yes, uh, absolutely. In the 27-minute long interview, Biden lays out a plan to redirect some police funding to other state-run departments to help with mental health resources, aid for direct access to police records, and tracking misconduct charges. According to the AP that same day, Biden also told reporters, we don't have to defund the police departments. We have to make sure they meet minimum basic standards of decency. This plan would not defund the police altogether, but rather redirect some department funding. Biden echoed that position in an op-ed published in USA Today on June 10th. So no, Joe Biden does not support taking away police funding altogether, but he does support reallocating how some of the money is used. But what about 
Meanwhile, the ads claims that defunding the police would remove 911 call centers from their control, slowing emergency response times. Proposal to remove 911 dispatchers from police control. This one falls into a gray area of sorts. While some 911 centers get some of their funding from police budgets, in Georgia, nearly all 911 funding comes from a special fee charged to every phone line. The Georgia Emergency Communications Authority, which was created because of our investigation into problems with the 911 system, collects those fees and disperses them to 911 centers, along with millions in federal grants. All of that is earmarked for 911, not police. So the idea of defunding the police would not necessarily slow 911 operator response times. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We got more 11 Alive news prime time after the break. To 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID. Welcome back, everyone. Experts say pregnant moms are more likely to become hospitalized if they're infected with COVID-19. So what should expecting moms do if they catch COVID before or after their delivery? Reveal investigator Andy Parati spoke with an Emory doctor and a mom about what it's like to be pregnant during a pandemic. We know it's a girl, so it's really fun. Sally King Benedict looks forward to meeting her future daughter. She stayed healthy during her pregnancy so far, but the Atlanta artist is nervous about catching COVID-19. It's just scary. You have to let go of that anxiety and just kind of keep telling yourself, okay, the ba you know, the baby's healthy. I'm going to stay as healthy as possible. While pregnant moms are not more likely to contract the virus, their symptoms can turn more severe. Denise Jamison is an obstetrician and chairs Emory University's Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. So there's some information that pregnant women with COVID are more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to need intensive care. So it's another reason why it's really important that pregnant women take all measures possible to avoid getting COVID. According to the Georgia Department of Public Health, at least 696 newborns have contracted the virus, 37 hospitalized, none have died. If a mother does contract COVID, Dr. Jamison says evidence shows most babies should not be separated from their mothers. And that's really important because we know that early bonding of babies and their mothers is really important and early breastfeeding is really important. Benedict wears masks and stays away from crowds, just as doctors recommend. So there will be no baby shower. Her biggest concern is not having the family support she needs after giving birth. That will be very tough um, if, if people are not able to, you know, be in our home and sort of, it requires a village, I need help. There is evidence mothers can pass along COVID-19 to their unborn children, but Dr. Jamison believes that's rare. And for the babies who do get sick, 
Doctors don't know about potential long-term effects because scientists are still learning about the virus. All the more reason doctors say that pregnant women should try to avoid getting this virus. We're still tracking a few of those scattered showers. And once we get rid of these tonight, it's going to be a lot drier tomorrow. Now we're not bringing the rain chance down to 0% tomorrow, but it is going to be a lot lower at about 20%. I really think a lot of us will make it through the day tomorrow without any rain at all. Here in Atlanta, we're looking good. We don't see any showers in our area right now, but we've been tracking some of these in far north Georgia and areas north and east of the city, and a lot of these are moving out of our state. These right here in northeast Georgia uh, that are in parts of Hart County up 85. We had some in Franklin County earlier with a lot of heavy rain. Some of this in Madison County here moving into Elbert County is where we have heavy rain, still some thunder and lightning, and that's going to keep moving on into South Carolina and get out of our area. We have a few additional showers coming out of Lumpkin County and into White County. North Hall, a little shower developing there with some heavy rain. That's going to keep moving to the east, and then uh, we'll, we'll keep watching these between Royst Royston and Comer that have some of that thunder and lightning with it. And here you see the stuff that came out of Fannin County, Union County, and Towns County. Most of the really heavy rain has pushed up in to Clay County, North Carolina near Shooting Creek where we have all that thunder and lightning there. And back here in our area, you can see how that's moving up to the north and east. Here in Atlanta, we're looking fine here. The showers over in West Georgia are very light. Nothing really major with that. That's going to continue weakening as they try to move in closer to the Atlanta area. Take a live look out there at this hour. This is our camera down in Coweta County. On the south side, things looking pretty good. You can see the courthouse there, re relatively dry conditions. We do have a few clouds and muggy conditions down there as well. Here's what we're watching with Hurricane East which is right over the Bahamas at this hour. This is getting closer to the Florida coastline. Now it's really going to be getting closer to Florida, mainly on Sunday when they're going to be feeling the impacts there. It'll be impacting the rest of the Bahamas here during the day on Saturday. Maximum sustained winds 80 miles an hour. This is based on the 8 p.m. advisory. We're going to get another advisory in right around or just a little bit before 11 o'clock. It's moving to the northwest at 15 miles an hour. Category one storm you can see here tomorrow in the afternoon. That's when it's approaching southeast Florida. They have hurricane warnings in effect for much of the Atlantic coastline of Florida. And you can see the latest track here brings the center of the storm pretty much right along the Atlantic coastline of Florida. This is mainly during the day on Sunday when they'll be feeling most of those impacts there. And then once we get into late Sunday night into early Monday, since it's encountering land, it most likely is going to go back to a tropical storm as it nears the Georgia coast. We don't think it'll be a direct hit on the Georgia coast, but it'll kind of move right by the coast to bring in some wind and rain along the Georgia coastline and then moving into the Carolinas as a tropical storm during the day on Monday and then quickly moving up toward the north and the east. On this track, since we're on the west side of the track, it looks like we will get the quieter side of the system and most likely not much of many impacts here in Metro Atlanta. Maybe just a slightly higher rain chance from Atlanta over to the east. Take a look at these temperatures. 85 here. Look at Carrollton at 75, Rome at 76. It's cooler there because they had some rain in there earlier that cooled things off a bit. Now tomorrow, we're going to go with an 8 on the wisometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Highs near 92 and a mix of sun and clouds and the rain chance on the low end only at 20 percent. We'll be at a 30 percent chance for showers here on Sunday. And then as we get into Monday, a 40 percent chance again, and that is all dependent on the track of what is going on with Isaisas off of the uh, coastline there. Back to a 30 percent chance Tuesday, lower rain chances Wednesday and Thursday, 30 percent chance again Friday with highs throughout the week there in the upper 80s to right around 90 degrees. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive. Almost a full week of tributes for Congressman John Lewis from Alabama to Washington, D.C., then ending here in Atlanta on Thursday with the celebration of his life. Joining me now is Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press. The funeral service for Congressman Lewis very memorable, including the eulogy by former President Obama, where he brought up something near and dear to Congressman Lewis's heart, and that's voting and voting rights. And what sort of impact do you think that will have on this in Congress? Jeff, I think the the I think it had even more impact by because of what happened earlier in the day. I mean, of, of all days for President Trump to float this trial balloon of delaying the election. Uh, he chose the day of John Lewis's funeral, right? A man who spent his whole life trying to expand the ability of people to participate in a democracy. Um, it, it, you know, I would love to know this. Put it this way, Jeff. I would love to know whether the draft of the eulogy that President Obama wrote the night before President Trump's tweet had the words George Wallace or Bull Connor in it. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe it had Bull Connor, but I wonder on George Wallace, right? And because it felt as if it almost had more of an impact, both on President Obama. I mean, he was, he was as fired up on something as I've seen in a while. And I think it, it is one of those, did President Trump just sort of awake a sleeping asset of Joe Biden's, right? Um, and I'll say this, I don't think you're going to see the Voting Rights Act voted on this year. I do think very early next year you will, particularly if there's uh, a change and it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up being hugely bipartisan um say even is say if the democrats are in control now if the republicans keep control of the senate maybe you won't get it but if the democrats get control and it gets introduced it wouldn't shock me if one of the co-sponsors is a guy named mitch mcconnell the the exit of john lewis is such nationally is so enormous but but here in atlanta where he was a city councilman where he would be seen at Braves games back in the early 1970s with, with sacks of hot dogs for his godson, Michael Julian Bond, mm -hmm. who's now an Atlanta City Councilman. <laughs> uh, it, such, such a figure here of, of, of being seen everywhere in the community, whether it's in a, a Kroger at night buying groceries. He was just one of those legends that you could see and touch and speak to and have your picture taken with. It's funny you say that, it, yes an accessible giant, right? We're so used to being people who are giants, uh, who are icons, and you don't get to touch them or see them. They're on statues or on monuments or they're behind a motorcade or they're behind a velvet rope. And like, you know, I can't believe people like you and I, Jeff, have gotten interviewed interview him multiple times because he's very accessible um, no matter who you were. You know, no offense to any of us, we, we weren't special, but he, he, he sort of treated everybody the same, and in that sense, he treated them really well, right? And that's why he, I think, came across so successful. It's also why there was a bipartisan outpouring, even if there wasn't always bipartisan support for his ideas. Yeah, you, because you, of, of, of how he, 
he saw the best in everybody, even if we didn't see that. You're, you're absolutely right about John Lewis. I mean, I did charity events with him back into the early to mid 1980s with him, uh, you know, appearing with him at, at Braves games or with the Braves when they were at the White House with President Clinton after winning the World Championship. I mean, he was just always accessible. Right. He was always seen in the community. And, and the likes of those kinds of men and women, quite frankly, um, I, I don't believe we're going to see again. And, and we're worse for that fact. Also, I wanted to bring up very quickly uh, Herman Cain, another Atlanta man, a huge following who died yesterday. Yeah. A, a a, a remarkable life. His father began as the chauffeur for Robert W. Woodruff, the Coca-Cola czar and, and chief of Atlanta, and and this amazing right. life here, and opted to go conservative, which certainly has stirred a lot of pots, not only here in Atlanta, but, but around the country as well. Just a, a life of impact. <laughs> Look, he's a dynamic uh, figure in both in the business world and in the political world. A, 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 you know, as CEO of Godfathers, head of the National Restaurant Association, was on the Federal Reserve. I mean, a, a very accomplished figure. And I think sometimes, I think too many people uh, outside of Atlanta, I think only saw him and remember him if they remember him as, oh, he's that 999 guy, you know, from the 2012 campaign. But, but he, he lived a very full life, a very impressive life. I do think his, his short-lived presidential campaign was was to me one of the first clues that boy there was a hunger in the republican party for something different don't yeah. give me the same cookie cutter candidates and so you know that early rise of herman cain in 2012 i think in hindsight was foreshadowing the eventual rise of donald trump yeah absolutely chuck thank you appreciate the insight meet the press air sunday morning at 10 right here on 11 alive have a great weekend chuck right, see you soon people who are sick avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive.
have some breaking news right now, folks. Governor Brian Kemp has extended Georgia's COVID-19 guidelines in state of emergency. So the new statewide order expires on August 15th. It was set to expire at midnight. So as part of this new order, Governor Brian Kemp still encourages face masks, but they are not mandated. And he extended the public health emergency until September 10th. And folks, this is the day thousands of Georgians out there have been dreading as they struggle through this economic crisis caused by this pandemic. Today, the $600 federal unemployment benefit expires at midnight. So yesterday, negotiations in Congress for a new relief bill or a new relief package completely broke down. This is all happening as the United States reports more Americans are now filing for first-time unemployment benefits. Republicans have proposed cutting the federal benefits to 200 bucks a week, but Democrats would not agree to that. So the White House says Democrats also rejected a one-week extension. Meanwhile, Democrats say they want a more comprehensive extension with money for schools and testing and aid to state and local governments. Well, the situation, as you know, is dire for a lot of small businesses that have thrived for generation, generations in Atlanta's West End and Castleberry Hill. Several, are, several of them are now facing the prospect of shutting down for good. But as 11 Allies Bill List reports, there is still time to get financial help if they need it. For predominantly African-American-owned small businesses on Atlanta's West End and in Castleberry Hill, COVID-19 is dealing a serious blow. The situation is very grim. And George Andrews of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank is not alone. Jason Clifton, president of the West End Merchants Coalition, shares the same view. In the Castleberry West End area, um, I would estimate we should, we should see 50, 60 percent of the small businesses in that area to go under. And that's what happened to small business owner Yolanda Owens. She owns Iwi Fresh, a spa and beauty business in Castleberry Hill. She got turned down once for an SBA loan and was forced to cut her staff by almost half and stop in walk-in business. She finally got a small loan, but says her business, which has been operating here for 13 years, is now in jeopardy. The main concern was paying our rent, paying my staff. Uh, we were not, I was not able to pay my staff. The PPP we got was not enough. We need more, and we are in danger of shutting down. It's a story that Andrews and Clifton say they hear day after day. But there is encouraging news. The SBA's Paycheck Protection Program will be extended through August the 8th, so there's still time for small businesses to apply. And the Economic Disaster Relief Program is in effect until the end of the year. You can also apply for that. And there is strong community support for other solutions. We need a bailout, and this bailout should be in the, in for, in the form of grants, in the form of no-interest loans repaid back over a long period of time. Also proposed a targeted fund aimed directly at small business, all with one goal, keep the doors open through COVID-19 for small business in the West End and in Castleberry Hill. On 11alive.com, we have several helpful links on how to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Relief Program. Showers are falling apart out there over most areas. A lot of us are dry. We've got just a few light showers still over in parts of West Georgia, some in Northeast Georgia and others over here to the east of us, north and east of Athens that still have some thunder and lightning with them. I'll take you up there first. You can see what we're watching up 85 as you get closer to Lake Hartwell. Lighter showers around Hartwell right now. The heavier activity is right here around Elberton where we have the heavier rain. Also some thunder and lightning with that. That's going to keep moving through Elbert County and push up into South Carolina. We have some additional showers. These developed in White County uh, with some heavy rain, a little thunder and lightning, and that's now moving up into Habersham County and Rabin County. We had stronger storms a little bit earlier up at, uh, right along the North Carolina line that have crossed over into North Carolina. Here's a look at that heavy rain. Royston, still a little bit of thunder and lightning there, and then those showers between cold water and Elberton with the thunder and lightning. And then we had that heavier rain in Fannin, Union County, still in Towns County, some lighter rain. There's a closer look at what we're seeing right there with that heavier cluster here 
coming out of Helen, extending up into parts of Habersham County. That's going to move up into Rabin, and that's going to weaken as it moves up into that direction, too. Really, a lot of lightning that was up in North Carolina earlier, Clay County getting in a lot of that. That's starting to weaken as it moves up to the north. And in West Georgia, just a few light showers there. That uh, shrinking process is going to continue as we have just a few sprinkles with that. Take a look at what else we're watching out there. Here in Atlanta, we're fine. A little bit of false echoes there around Peachtree City, but we have dry weather here in Atlanta right now. This is a live look in Rome where we're still watching a little bit of that light rain over in West Georgia. Nothing going on in the Rome area right now. I hope you're ready for some drying for the weekend and lower rain chances because that's what I get to tell you about in just a few minutes. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. The CDC report on summer camps is raising alarm bells as some families prepare to send their kids back to the classroom, of course, and all eyes are going to be on the three districts in Georgia that gave parents the choice. Let your kids continue learning from home or actually give them an opportunity to go back to the classroom. Well, there's a small school district in Jackson County. They've already taken the leap. Jefferson City Schools started back today. They serve about 3,700 students and 115 faculty. We saw bus drivers, students, and staff wearing face masks during drop-off hours at Jefferson Elementary School. The parents we spoke to, they say this was a relief for them. My daughter was having trouble doing the virtual learning. Um, it was causing her a little bit of anxiety just being at home all the time. So I'm thankful that Jefferson has opened their doors back up. Absolutely. I would have to quit work and teach at home, and it makes life very difficult, especially when my husband's overseas. We have to keep them in school. Well, I think you can practice safe distance and you can do all the right things. But children are important, and I don't think they should be just kept at home. I really don't. So to put this into perspective, in Jackson County, there are 912 total cases of COVID-19. So according to the latest numbers, which makes 28 new cases today, almost half of those cases are from the past couple of weeks. 31 people have died from the virus there and 91 people have been hospitalized. Well, Monday is back to school day for students in Cherokee County. Parents were able to choose whether they wanted in-person or digital learning. So for those parents choosing virtual, this is the last weekend to get ready to prepare. 11 Allies' Brittany Klein-Peters spoke with some of those parents who say the virtual model concerns them. Nobody knows what to tell their children to do Monday morning when they sit down to go to school. Nobody does. We have, I don't even have a website to tell them to log into. Parents of Cherokee County students tell me that they have been given little to no guidance on how to prepare for virtual learning. I've been getting lots of emails from the district, but they're all about the students who are going back to school, about meet and greets and, and PE uniforms and all that, but absolutely nothing is coming out for the digital students. I just feel like, you know, they, they just threw it together and said, here. You know, we'll figure it out as we go. And the parents say that teachers in the public school district appear to be just as distressed about virtual learning as they are. One of my friends, her son's first grade teacher reached out to her and basically said, it, information is trickling into us. We don't know anything. We'll let you know when we do. Pretty much right off next week as any type of learning experience. So like, I know teachers are quitting. Wow. So, yeah, so they definitely are quitting. Um, I know they had sent out, like, a notification the other day saying, like, you know, if a teacher takes a leave or if they resign, not to worry that they have people lined up, like retired teachers or things like that. These families say they just want the district to treat virtual instruction with the same importance as in person. I just hope that they get this together. I hope that everything does go as smooth as they present it to to be um, for the sake of all these kids. The school district told me that they have been working around the clock to prepare for the start of Monday for both in-person and virtual learning. They did decline to do an interview due to reaching out to parents directly. 
So one of the biggest struggles out there of transitioning to virtual learning is internet access. Because some families don't have an internet connection or they don't even have a laptop. So, and if they do, they may not have one for each school age child that is now learning from home. So school districts across the metro are trying to ease that burden. As Christy Diaz reports, they're having to get a little creative. Welcome to the classroom of the 2020 pandemic. 100% virtual. Marietta City Schools, Atlanta Public Schools, and DeKalb County Schools are just three of the districts going all virtual into the new school year. A decision most can agree is not ideal. It takes a lot. I think many of us have learned that to sit for a while and talk to a device. We miss human interaction. On top of that, the FCC reports 25 million Americans lack access to a broadband connection. You can't have a device and not have the basic Wi-Fi, right? And if your Wi-Fi is interrupted every five to 10 minutes, how effective is that engagement? We had a family pull up uh, to the school building who had five children, and she said, I've got two laptops, but can I get three more? And I think I need another hotspot. And literally, we're just trying to meet the unique needs of our children. So therefore, they don't fall through the cracks of this pandemic. Districts are doing everything they can to remove at least that hurdle from this new way of life. APS handing out six to 10,000 devices and hotspots. DeKalb buying Chromebooks. And Marietta City Schools gathering supplies from three different vendors to get the 700 hotspots they needed. And they're about to buy 100 more. We had to literally cobble together. We got all the hotspots back from seniors. We're prepared to give them to kindergartners. In May, 448 internet-enabled school buses were deployed to 36 rural counties. Thanks to a five-month service donation, these buses will continue to provide Wi-Fi bubbles in areas of highest need at the start of the school year. Marietta also using this strategy and says not only has it allowed them to keep paying their drivers, it enhances connection far beyond what the internet can provide. Literally every day on the same exact routes, the kids would lay a blanket in the front yard and just be able to wave to the bus driver and wave to a neighbor. It's just our effort to try to keep a sense of community and obviously our effort to keep a sense of connectivity. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Welcome back, everyone. Many uh, countries around the globe are now banning U.S. travelers as our COVID-19 cases continue to rise. Americans who are already abroad are finding it really difficult to make it back home. And there's one local mom battling cancer while trying to care for her son with Down syndrome while her daughter is now stranded in India. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez spoke with them today. My body and the condition that it's in I could go any time, but I would like to see Sarah before I go. Not only is Lisa Robbins at a high risk for COVID-19, but she also has cancer, suffers from several autoimmune diseases. She is bedridden, and her greatest fear is not seeing her daughter Sarah again. I need her here if I want to survive everything that I'm going through. Sarah traveled to India for work back in October, but has been stranded since March. That's when India first closed its borders due to the pandemic. According to the State Department website, as of June, there have been 45 repatriation flights out of India. United Airlines has also resumed some flights to the U.S. through the end of July. But Sarah says every time she tries to come home, she runs into an obstacle. Every single one was unavailable, unavailable, unavailable. While there are ways out of India through KLM, Air France and Lufthansa, they are mostly to Europe. Sarah worries getting on one of these flights might lead her to being stranded yet again, but this time with zero help. Even if I get on a flight to one of these other countries, a lot of countries now are banning travel either outside of their country at all or specifically to the U.S. Unable to come home to take care of her mother, her brother, who has Down syndrome, will also be left without a caregiver. Now, after months of failed attempts, Sarah says she sees no light at the end of the tunnel and worries she won't make it home anytime soon. Even without a virus, something could happen to her. She already could possibly not survive. And so my greatest fear is something happening to her while I'm still in India. Sarah says while there are some seemingly available flights online, when she schedules these, these are later canceled. Now, this is all due to the evolving pandemic. We have reached out to the U.S. Embassy in Kolkata, India, but have not heard back yet. We still have some stubborn showers out there that are holding together up in northeast Georgia and then in West Georgia, just a few light showers. This stuff you see on the south side, false echoes coming in this time of night here around the radar site. Let me take you up to the north, though. I want to show you these areas that we're watching first up 85. You can see just a few spotty showers here uh, in the kind of behind the heavier rain that came through earlier. Some of this about to move into Stevens County, uh, the northern parts there coming out of Hall County to northern Banks County, a couple little isolated showers near Jackson County too. thunder and lightning near Elberton. That's going to keep moving up into South Carolina, and there's a closer look at that right now, and there's a few of those other showers near Commerce, a little bit of heavy rain, but those are just very isolated, and they're going to be moving uh, over to the east and weakening. These coming out of White County into the northern parts of Habersham County, southern parts of Rabin County between Clayton and Tallulah Falls. This has some really heavy rain with it and thunder and lightning, and that really kind of started to develop a little bit here, and let's take a look at the lightning count. About nine lightning strikes in the last 15 minutes. That's going to keep moving through up into South Carolina and fall apart. These lighter showers in parts of northwest Georgia are falling apart as well. You can see how that green area is just kind of shrinking. Nothing going on here in Atlanta at this hour, and I do think it's going to be dry for the rest of the nighttime hours. Take a look at what we're watching out there for tonight. You can see the wind that we're going to be watching with Hurricane Isaias, which is right now the center of the storm, is really impacting parts of the central Bahamas. We're watching Florida closely because it's going to continue moving up toward the north. This is a look at the wind fields, and you can see the wind that's going to be moving through uh, parts of Florida during the day here on Saturday, also into Sunday. And I know you may be wondering, as this gets closer to the Georgia coast right here, 
What will the conditions be like? We don't think it's going to be a direct hit with the center of the storm on the Georgia coast, but it's going to be near the Georgia coast and the heaviest winds are going to be on the right hand side of the center. And so since the Georgia coast is on the left hand side of the center or on the western side, there will be some wind and rough surf and rain along the Georgia coastline, but they're not going to be experiencing hurricane force winds there. And some of those stronger winds will move into the Charleston area. Here's a look at the spaghetti model plots. And with this, we look at the trends kind of keeping the center of the storm pretty much on the west side of or actually the east side of Florida along that eastern coastline there and then moving up the coast and then racing quickly up toward the north and east. We're going to be on the quieter system here. I really don't anticipate us seeing much of any impacts at all. Maybe just a slightly higher rain chance on Monday, but I think that rain chance will be a little bit more as you go on over to the uh, east. We have a potential for another tropical storm. This is with the tropical depression that's developing off the coast of Africa. It may briefly become a tropical storm. The next name on the list is Josephine, and then it's going to fall apart. That's not going to have any impact on us here either. High today, it was warm. 92. We should be around 89 for this time of year. We didn't get any rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson today, so the surplus is back to just under 11 inches above where we should be for the year. Here's a look at the weather headlines. Lower rain chances for your weekend. A 20% chance on Saturday and then a 30% chance on Sunday. It will be getting hotter though with temperatures back to the 90s. And of course we are tracking Isaiah Isaias as it continues to move up the Florida coast during the weekend and then flirt with the Georgia coast on Monday. 92 for a high Saturday, 90 on Sunday. Rain chance at 30% Sunday. Monday is the day with the highest rain chance at 40%, but I really think those chances will be higher over in East Georgia. Back to a 30% chance for showers Tuesday. Lower rain chances Wednesday and Thursday. 30% chance again Friday with highs in the upper 80s to the lower 90s. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. 
Tonight in downtown Decatur, a former Confederate monument will be temporarily replaced with a hologram of George Floyd's face. It's formed by fireflies here. Floyd's death at the hands of Minneapolis police on May 25th sparked an international outcry, leading to widespread protests and traveling memorial is organized by Change.org and the George Floyd Foundation to seek to replace Confederate monuments with, quote, symbols of solidarity and also justice. The project is uh, following a route uh, that's been formed since 1961. We're going to see you back here on 11 Alive, of course, on our sister station on 11 Alive. Have a great night. Atlanta Speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight, new information about an outbreak of COVID-19 among more than 260 children and adults. This all happened at the YMC summer camp. That's Camp High Harbor in Rabin County, not far from Clayton. The CDC is reporting that the virus at the camp spread easily and quickly among the campers and the staff and fast within a couple of days, even though the YMCA tried to observe most safety precautions. John Sherrick is on it. All new for us tonight. It's a story about the YMCA apparently trying to give children a great and safe summer camp at Camp High Harbor in Rabin County, trying to follow all CDC and Georgia guidelines for guarding against COVID-19. So what happened? Even the CDC can't say for sure. But its report released Friday does say this. More than 250 campers and staffers ended up testing positive for COVID-19. On June 17th, staffers reported to camp and the YMCA says all of them had tested negative within the previous 12 days. 
cases. On June 22nd, a teen staffer felt sick, and on June 24th, tested positive. The camp started sending all the children home. Out of 597 campers and staff, 44% later tested positive, which would be 263 people. 11 Alive medical correspondent Dr. Sujatha Reddy says that that one staffer's earlier negative test was likely outdated by the time the camp started. So it's quite possible that staff member was exposed and contracted the virus just before coming to camp. As it is, among the 346 children at camp, 49% of them ended up testing positive. The CDC concluded that there were high attack rates among persons in all age groups, despite efforts by camp officials to implement most recommended strategies to prevent transmission. The multiple measures adopted by the camp were not sufficient to prevent an outbreak. Engaging in regular singing and cheering likely contributed to transmission. Use of cloth masks was not universal. So what about the risk to children and teachers going back to the classroom? Sleepaway camp with three to 500 people is a very different scenario than a classroom with 10 or 20 children. I think it will be easier to keep the CDC protocol in a school than it would be in a summer camp. The YMCA says it made every effort to keep everyone safe at camp, but now in retrospect regrets the decision to open camp last month. On this Friday night, breaking news now. Governor Kemp is extending Georgia's COVID-19 guidelines and state of emergency. The new statewide order expires August 15th. It was set to expire at midnight. As part of the order, Governor Kemp still encouraging face masks, but they are not mandated. He extended the public health emergency until September 10th. This comes as the number of COVID-related deaths took another jump today. 81 deaths now reported. This comes as the state announces 4,066 new COVID-19 cases. Gwinnett had the largest increase, 419 new cases. Fulton second with 360. Extra unemployment benefits, a part of the CARE Act, expi uh, CARE Act expired today. The Senate could not reach an agreement on extending the $600 payment for Americans who are out of work. 30 million Americans are collecting some form of unemployment amid the pandemic. Today was the first day of school for Jefferson City, Georgia students. Parents chose between in-person and virtual learning. The district says that it has employed nurses for each school to comply with new COVID-19 measures. They are encouraging face masks for students and emphasizing that parents and guardians monitor children's health before sending them to school every day. More than 40,000 more children will return to school on Monday for virtual or in-person instruction in Cherokee County. However, some parents say the district isn't ready to go virtual. Concerned parents took to social media expressing their concerns this week. Some of the families that we spoke to say they regret signing up for virtual learning and that option because there has been little to no guidance from the district. Nobody Not feels ready to start Monday morning. Nobody, and I just went through a few dozen comments in one of my online groups. Nobody knows what to tell their children to do Monday morning when they sit down to go to school. Nobody does. Um, we have, I don't even have a website to tell them to log into. The school district told us that they have been working around the clock to prepare for the reopening and declined to interview in order to focus on communicating directly with parents. On 11alive.com, we posted a back-to-school guide breaking down the plans this fall for each metro Atlanta district. You can also get it sent to your phone. All you have to do is text the word school to the number on your screen, 404-885-7600. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb tracking a hurricane that could be nearing the Georgia coast. Chris, what's the latest? Yeah, we're going to be watching this throughout the weekend as this is still down in the Bahamas right now. Maximum sustained winds at 80 miles an hour. That is hurricane strength. We're going to get another update in within the hour uh, on a forecast track. Here's the storm right here in the Bahamas. It still has a long way to go before it gets to the Georgia coastline. But through the weekend, it's going to be moving up the Florida coastline. In fact, they do have a hurricane warning in effect for much of the Atlantic coast of Florida and many of these warnings here in the Bahamas as well. Here's 
the storm and the track showing this nearing the Florida coast. This is during the afternoon hours here on Saturday and then just kind of moving up the coast during the day Saturday and the early on Sunday pushing up the coast as well. Monday is the day when the Georgia coast is going to be watching as it's most likely going to be a tropical storm then still bringing in some rain, some wind along the Georgia coast and some strong uh, rough surf along the coast as well and then moving up to the Carolinas and then quickly moving up toward the north and east. We're on the quiet side of this system. We really think the impacts here in Metro Atlanta will be minimal, but stay with us coming up in just a few minutes. We'll talk about the timing again and what some of those specific impacts could be along the Georgia coast. We'll have more on that coming up today. Athens police addressed their use of tear gas and projectiles during a protest back in May on May 31st. Activist groups and gathered downtown to call for social change. Police say later in the evening, armed extremist groups showed up with gas masks and loaded down backpacks dressed all in black. We are told most of the demonstrators then left. Police say they had learned of the looting and vandalism threats before the protest and decided to enact a curfew around 9 p.m. They say several warnings were issued to the group hours before officers dispersed chemicals into the crowd after midnight. 18 people were arrested. New tonight at 10, a space once home to a Confederate monument will be the temporary home for a hologram of George Floyd. Hope Ford is live in the Decatur Square. She has more for us tonight. Hope. Yeah, that's right. The hologram went up about 30 minutes ago now. It's it's right back there. You can see it. And this uh, the George Floyd hologram tour has been going through uh, the southern states and stopping specifically at areas where Confederate monuments have been removed. And so, uh, standing right there, actually around it, you see some of the members of a of the platform Change.org. They actually started this project, and uh, representatives of the platform tell us they hope to transform these spaces and promote uh, forward thinking. So this is one of the smaller holograms that we have seen in other cities that they've toured. We've seen a, a much bigger version of that, but actually over here. I'm just taking a quick little walk. So this is actually where the uh, the Confederate monument was at one point in time. That was taken down on June 26th uh, once a DeKalb County judge uh, ruled uh, that it was a public nuisance. Uh, so that is why they chose uh, this specific location. But George Floyd's face isn't actually the only face out here tonight. There was actually a, an, an artist who uh, spent several hours drawing these uh, these chalk uh, chalk portraits uh, right here and there. There's some faces that that are also familiar. We have. Uh, Brianna Taylor up there at the top, Jamarian Robinson, and Jimmy Atchison, and Oscar Kane. And so we talked to the artist, and uh, she said that she wanted to put the faces of Atlanta men killed by police on this sidewalk to keep their images out in the public as well as George Floyd's. And being that this is such a critical election year, you know, everybody's making promises to open these cases up and to do what's right by these people. And these are our young men, these are Atlanta young men. And that was the artist, uh, Ashley, she, she, uh, she, I believe she's going to be do, doing a, a few more out here at uh, Decatur Square. So uh, that hologram will be up for probably another hour and then it will come down. And again, uh, this tour has already stopped in Virginia, North Carolina, and of course, Georgia. And they will continue to make this tour uh, throughout the southern states. And again, they're hoping uh, they're, they're uh, change.org uh, are hoping to promote positivity and forward thinking with this tour. Hey, Hope, how, do, how does that hologram work? Is that a, a, against a screen or, or how does that how does that stand? So they actually have a whole little production over here that we can kind of show you. So this one in particular is up against a, a, a large screen there. They kind of had to angle it uh, a little bit earlier because it was the wind was kind of messing with things out here. But it is off of a screen and they have a projector that's, uh, you know, it's 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 a little bit farther back over here. Uh, that's pro projecting that onto the screen and it's just been playing on a loop. And of course, they have lights out here as well. Uh, and again, as we've seen in other cities, uh, some of them have been a lot larger and projected at a at a higher uh, altitude than we have for for this one right now. Hope Ford and Decatur, thank you for the tutorial on the hologram of George Floyd. Appreciate it. The ballot is now set for the special election to finish Congressman John Lewis's current term in Washington. Candidates needed to qualify by this afternoon. Joe Hankey has a look at the candidates and the reason the fifth district voters may need to head to the polls three times.
Nobody but John Lewis has represented Georgia's 5th District since 1987, but seven candidates are now squaring off to complete the civil rights leader's current term. On the ballot will be Democrat and former Morehouse President Robert Franklin, Democrat and former Atlanta City Council Member Kwanzaa Hall, Barrington Martin II, a Democrat who ran against Lewis in the 5th District primary earlier this year, coming in second with more than 20,000 votes. Also qualifying, Atlanta Minister Stephen Muhammad, an independent candidate, Libertarian Chase Oliver, current Democratic State House Representative Abel Mabel Thomas, and former State House Rep Democrat Keisha Waits. Voters will choose between the seven during a September 29th special election. If needed, a runoff will be held on December 1st. The winner will leave office on January 2nd, so they may serve only a matter of weeks. Between those two dates is the November 3rd general election. That is when Democrat State Senator Nakima Williams and Republican Angela Stanton King will be on the ballot. They are competing to represent the 5th District in D.C. for a full two years. We spoke with Emory's political science professor, Dr. Andra Gillespie, who joins us as an analyst. She believes the, five, the uh, District 5 special election could turn into a runoff. What the field tells me is that we are likely to move to a December runoff, which means that whoever wins this seat will only have the benefit of being a member of Congress for a month. They will likely just serve, uh, they will really serve in a placeholder position, and I think it would be a question of what issues could come up in the last um, month of that session of Congress that could be consequential. She predicts there may be low voter turnout in September, but Dr. Gillespie says the candidates could avoid a runoff if they get their supporters to the polls. Could wearing goggles or a face shield protect you from COVID? What top health experts, including Dr. Fauci, say about the extra piece of protective equipment? That's coming up. Committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Top experts in health say there is hope that a COVID-19 vaccine could be ready by the end of the year. Let's say that again, could be ready by the end of the year. Dr. Anthony Fauci and other health officials testified today on Capitol Hill. He says he is cautiously optimistic about the potential vaccine that is going through a late phase trial of 30,000 people. Never a guarantee that you're gonna get a safe and effective vaccine, but from everything we've seen now, in the animal data, as well as the early human data, we feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine by the end of this year and as we go into 2021. So I don't think it's dreaming, Congresswoman. I believe it's a reality and will be shown to be a reality. Finally, some good news this week, right? Dr. Fauci also made headlines when he spoke with an ABC News reporter about wearing goggles or a face shield to protect your eyes from the virus. He says it's good to protect the moist tissue that lines the inside of the human body, which is found in your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Dr. Fauci says while it's not universally recommended, it would indeed provide extra protection. 
We've been tracking a few areas of rain and even thunderstorm activity that's been moving over parts of North Georgia and Northeast Georgia. It's all starting to move out of our area though now with just a couple little lingering showers that are left behind. Still heavy activity. This is in Rabin County between uh, Clayton and down near Habersham County near Clarksville. Also another area of rain in Tacoa and Stevens County that has heavy rain with thunder and lightning with it. This is about to cross over into South Carolina is going to be pushing out of our area. We have about 37 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes inside this red box, including that in Tacoa and some of these showers down along 85 along the South Carolina border, and that's going to keep moving over to the north and east. In Atlanta, we've been dry for much of the evening hours. We've had a few showers. We've been watching over uh, on the west side. Very light stuff now coming in through parts of Harrelson County, Polk County, Floyd County, a little bit of light rain pushing into Bartow County, not too far off from Cartersville, northern Paulding County, a couple of showers, and those are going to continue to weaken. Let's take a look at the bigger picture. I want to show you what we're watching with Hurricane Isaias, which is uh, down in the central Bahamas right now. It's a category one storm. It actually strengthened a little bit this evening with the 8 p.m. advisory showing 80 mile an hour winds moving to the northwest at about 15 miles an hour. The storm will continue pushing up, getting closer to Florida in the afternoon hours on Saturday. So it's going to be really late Saturday and into Sunday when we're going to be tracking the storm moving up along the coast of Florida on the Atlantic side uh, where they have that hurricane warning in effect. Sunday at 2 in the afternoon, still right around the, the Melbourne area or near the Space Coast. And then it may weaken a little bit to a tropical storm as we get into Monday because it's going to be encountering land on one side of the system. And so it's on Monday when we're going to be watching for any potential impacts on the Georgia coast. Now, the good news is we don't think it's going to make a direct landfall into Georgia. We think it's going to stay along the coastline here and the Georgia coast is on the quieter side of this system. There is the potential for some rain, some wind on Monday, and really rough surf is going to be the main impacts that we'll be feeling along the Georgia coast. Then it moves up along the Carolinas and then it pushes up quickly up toward the north and east. So here in Metro Atlanta, we're on the quiet side of the system, so I'm really not concerned about any major impacts for us. We may just see a slight increase in our rain chances going into Monday. So here's a look at those winds. As you can see, the center of circulation just off the coast there on Monday, that's going to be the time frame when we'll see some of those winds. We're talking maybe 20 to 30 mile an hour winds on that uh, left hand side or the west side of the center of the storm coming in along the Georgia coast. The stronger winds are going to be on the right hand side and in these quadrants here on this side of the storm as it moves on through. So uh, we'll keep watching it. If that track changes at all, that would change the impacts along the Georgia coast. Tomorrow we're up to 92. We're going to go with an eight on the wasometer. Rain chance is going to be a lot lower. Okay, now watch these showers that we've been seeing pushing out of our area. Once those move out, we have some drier air that's going to move in here tonight. In the morning, it'll be dry with sunshine. Great start to the day. And then as we get into the afternoon hours on Saturday, we're only going with a 20% chance for a shower. It's kind of nice to see not much green showing up here. Then into Sunday, we'll go back up to about a 30% chance for some scattered showers that'll move through with those temperatures that get up to the lower 90s as we head through the weekend. So just be aware when those rain chances go down, it is going to be a lot uh, a lot uh, hotter through the weekend. And then as we continue through the rest of the period, lower rain chances on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday with highs in the upper 80s to lower 90s. Take a look at your weather wow moment for tonight where this is a beautiful double rainbow. This is taken by one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Carol Carmichael in the Carrollton area. Uh, this was yesterday where she took this picture, so thank you for sharing that with us. Carol is one of our storm trackers. You can be one too on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member of this closed group. We'll let you in. You can see what other people are sharing about weather in the area, and you can share your own weather information, pictures, and video too. All right, coming up next, we have the story of COVID-19 travel restrictions, how they have split up a Georgia family in a time when they need to be together. We spoke to the mother about what it's like to fight cancer and have her daughter so far away. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. 
Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Many countries around the world are banning U.S. travelers as the COVID-19 COVID cases rise in America. Americans who are already abroad are finding it difficult to come home. One local mother is battling cancer while trying to care for her son with Down syndrome. All this while her daughter is stranded in India. Elvin Lopez spoke with them today. My body and the condition that it's in. I could go anytime, but I would like to see Sarah before I go. Not only is Lisa Robbins at a high risk for COVID-19, but she also has cancer, suffers from several autoimmune diseases. She is bedridden and her greatest fear is not seeing her daughter Sarah again. I need her here if I want to survive everything that I'm going through. Sarah traveled to India for work back in October, but has been stranded since March. That's when India first closed its borders due to the pandemic. According to the State Department website, as of June, there have been 45 repatriation flights out of India. United Airlines has also resumed some flights to the U.S. through the end of July. But Sarah says every time she tries to come home, she runs into an obstacle. Every single one was unavailable, unavailable, unavailable. While there are ways out of India through KLM, Air France and Lufthansa, they are mostly to Europe. Sarah worries getting on one of these flights might lead her to being stranded yet again, but this time with zero help. Even if I get on a flight to one of these other countries, a lot of countries now are banning travel either outside of their country at all or specifically to the U.S. Unable to come home to take care of her mother, her brother, who has Down syndrome, will also be left without a caregiver. Now, after months of failed attempts, Sarah says she sees no light at the end of the tunnel and worries she won't make it home anytime soon. Even without a virus, something could happen to her. She already could possibly not survive. And so my greatest fear is something happening to her while I'm still in India. Sarah says while there are some seemingly available flights online, when she schedules these, these are later canceled. Now, this is all due to the evolving pandemic. We have reached out to the U.S. Embassy in Kolkata, India, but have not heard back yet. Local small businesses are struggling to stay afloat as the country's economy shrinks, but there is a lifeline. More on that coming up next.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email. This was the day thousands of Georgians had been dreading as they struggled through the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. Today, the $600 federal unemployment benefit expired, and yesterday negotiations in Congress for a new relief package completely broke down. And it all happened as the United States reported more Americans are filing for first-time unemployment benefits. Republicans had proposed cutting the federal benefits to $200 a week, but Democrats would not agree. The White House says Democrats also rejected a one-week extension. Meanwhile, Democrats say they want a more comprehensive extension with money for schools and testing and aid to state and local governments. This situation also is dire for small businesses that have thrived for generations in Atlanta's West End and Castleberry Hill. Several are facing the prospect of shutting down for good, but as 11 Alive's Bill List reports, there is still time to get the financial help they need. For predominantly African-American-owned small businesses on Atlanta's West End and in Castleberry Hill, COVID-19 is dealing a serious blow. The situation is very grim. And George Andrews of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank is not alone. Jason Clifton, president of the West End Merchants Coalition, shares the same view. In the Castleberry West End area, um, I would estimate we should, we should see 50, 60 percent of the small businesses in that area to go under. And that's what happened to small business owner Yolanda Owens. She owns Iwi Fresh, a spa and beauty business in Castleberry Hill. She got turned down once for an SBA loan and was forced to cut her staff by almost half and stop in walk-in business. 
she finally got a small loan but says her business which has been operating here for 13 years is now in jeopardy the main concern was paying our rent paying my staff uh, we were not i was not able to pay my staff the ppp we got was not enough we need more and we are in danger of shutting down it's a story that Andrews and Clifton say they hear day after day. But there is encouraging news. The SBA's Paycheck Protection Program will be extended through August the 8th, so there's still time for small businesses to apply. And the Economic Disaster Relief Program is in effect until the end of the year. You can also apply for that. And there is strong community support for other solutions. We need a bailout. And this bill allows to be in the, in, form, in the form of grants, in the form of no interest loans repaid back over a long period of time. Also proposed the targeted fund aimed directly at small business, all with one goal, keep the doors open through COVID-19 for small business in the West End and in Castleberry Hill. And George Andrews of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank, not alone, Jason Clifton, president, uh, the West End Merchants Coalition shares that same view. Welcome to the classroom of the 2020 pandemic. 100% virtual. Marietta City Schools, Atlanta Public Schools, and DeKalb County Schools are just three of the districts going all virtual into the new school year. A decision most can agree is not ideal. It takes a lot. I think many of us have learned that to sit for a while and talk to a device. We miss human interaction. On top of that, the FCC reports 25 million Americans lack access to a broadband connection. You can't have a device and not have the basic Wi-Fi, right? And if your Wi-Fi is interrupted every five to 10 minutes, how effective is that engagement? We had a family pull up uh, to the school building who had five children and she said, I've got two laptops, but can I get three more? And I think I need another hotspot. And literally we're just trying to meet the unique needs of our children. So therefore they don't fall through the cracks of this pandemic. Districts are doing everything they can to remove at least that hurdle from this new way of life. APS handing out six to 10,000 devices and hotspots. DeKalb buying Chromebooks and Marietta City Schools gathering supplies from three different vendors to get the 700 hotspots they needed. And they're about to buy a hundred more. We had to literally cobble together. We got all the hotspots back from seniors, we're prepared to give them to kindergartners. In May, 448 internet-enabled school buses were deployed to 36 rural counties. Thanks to a five-month service donation, these buses will continue to provide Wi-Fi bubbles in areas of highest need at the start of the school year. Marietta also using this strategy and says not only has it allowed them to keep paying their drivers, it enhances connection far beyond what the internet can provide. Literally every day on the same exact routes, the kids would lay a blanket in the front yard and just be able to wave to the bus driver and wave to a neighbor. It's just our effort to try to keep a sense of community and obviously our effort to keep a sense of connectivity. The state is hoping that $6 million in CARES Act funding will help schools get to where they need to be. The money will be used to buy things like Wi-Fi, transmitters on school buses, and other connectivity solutions. If your family has a need for a device, or internet hotspot. We have posted links to several resources that you can find on our website and the addresses where those buses will be parked in Marietta. You can find everything on 11alive.com. A Florida teen and two others are now charged in the Twitter hack attack that took over the accounts of several prominent accounts. State authorities in Florida say that 17-year-old Graham Clark was the mastermind of the attack. He now faces 30 state felony charges and federal charges may also be filed. Federal authorities also charge Mason, Shepherd of the United Kingdom, and Nima Fazeli of Orlando. The accounts targeted in the attack belong to those of President Obama, Joe Biden, Kanye West, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, and Elon Musk. Newly unsealed documents are showing communication between accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein and his confidant, Ghislaine Maxwell, who was accused of recruiting underage girls for Epstein to sexually abuse. Her attorneys claim she had not been in contact with Epstein for more than a decade. But those documents unsealed yesterday appear to show the two correspondent just five years ago. In one email sent a few weeks after one of Epstein's alleged victims shared her story with a British newspaper, Epstein told Maxwell, you've done nothing wrong and I would urge you to start acting like it. The documents are from a defamation case filed against Maxwell in 2015 by a woman 
who alleged that Epstein sexually abused her and that Maxwell and Epstein directed her to have sex with men between 2000 and 2002. After months of suspense, presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden expected to announce his pick for VP next week. Back in March, Biden vowed to choose a female running mate, but he has kept quiet about who that might be. His speculation has included Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, California Congressman Karen Bass, whose name seems to be rising right now, and former presidential candidate Senator Kamala Harris. And that is just to name a few. Meanwhile, President Trump tweeted today that his team is launching a new ad campaign against Biden that will commence on Monday. Almost a full week of tributes for Congressman John Lewis from Alabama to Washington, D.C., then ending here in Atlanta on Thursday with the celebration of his life. Joining me now is Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press. The funeral service for Congressman Lewis, very memorable, including the eulogy by former President Obama, where he brought up something near and dear to Congressman Lewis's heart, and that's voting and voting rights. And what sort of impact do you think that will have on this in Congress? Jeff, I think the the I think it had even more impact by because of what happened earlier in the day. I mean, of, of all days for President Trump to float this trial balloon of delaying the election, uh, he chose the day of John Lewis's funeral. Right, a man who spent his whole life trying to expand the ability of people to participate in a democracy. Um, it, it, you know, I would love to know this. Put it this way, Jeff. I would love to know whether the draft of the eulogy that President Obama wrote the night before President Trump's tweet had the words George Wallace or Bull Connor in it. It felt as if it almost had more of an impact both on President Obama. I mean, he was he was as fired up on something as I've seen in a while, and I think it, it is one of those, did President Trump just sort of awake a sleeping asset of Joe Biden's, right? Um, and I'll say this, I don't think you're going to see the Voting Rights Act voted on this year. I do think very early next year you will, particularly if there is uh, a change. And it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up being hugely bipartisan. The, the exit of John Lewis is such nationally, is so enormous. But, but here in Atlanta, where he was a city councilman, where he would be seen at Braves games back in the early 1970s with, with sacks of hot dogs for his godson, Michael Julian Bond, mm -hmm. who's now an Atlanta city councilman. <laughs> uh, it, such such a figure here of, of, of being seen everywhere in the community, whether it's in a, a Kroger at night buying groceries. He was just one of those legends that you could see and touch and speak to and have your picture taken with. It's funny you say that. It, yes, an accessible giant, right? We're so used to being people who are giants, uh, who are icons, and you don't get to touch them or see them. They're on statues or on monuments or they're behind a motorcade or they're behind a velvet rope. And, like, you know, I can't believe people like you and I, Jeff, have gotten interviewed multiple times. He saw the best in everybody, even if we didn't see that. Also, I wanted to bring up very quickly uh, Herman Cain, another Atlanta man, a huge following, who died yesterday, yeah. a, a, a remarkable life. His father began as the chauffeur for Robert W. Woodruff, the Coca-Cola czar and, and chief of Atlanta, and, and this amazing right. life here, and opted to go conservative, which certainly has stirred a lot of pots, not only here in Atlanta, but, but around the country as well. Just a, a life of impact. <laughs> Look, he's a dynamic uh, figure in both in the business world and in the political world, but, but he, he lived a very full life, a very impressive life. I do think his, his short-lived presidential campaign was, was, to me, one of the first clues that, boy, there was a hunger in the Republican Party for something different. Don't yeah. give me the same cookie-cutter candidates. And so, you know, that early rise of Herman Cain in 2012, I think, in hindsight, was foreshadowing the eventual rise of Donald Trump. Yeah, absolutely. Chuck, thank you. Appreciate the insight. Meet the press air Sunday morning at 10 right here on 11 Alive. Have a great weekend, Chuck. Right, See you soon. And exactly how early do you have to send in your absentee ballot to make it count in November? We're verifying viral claims about those deadlines. And we continue to watch not only what's happening here locally, but also what's going on in the tropics with Hurricane Isaias. Stay with us. We'll let you know whether or not that system will have any impacts on the state of Georgia. Coming up in sports, baseball's commissioner, an ominous tone tonight where he says Major League Baseball may be stopped, may be canceled if they can't control the coronavirus.
Braves are not being stopped either. That story when we come back. ...to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. When should you mail in your ballot to make sure that it has been counted? Viral claims say it has to be two weeks before the election. In the case of the November election, that would be October 20th. But our verified team found that you need to mark a different date on your calendar. Here's Jason Puckett. Let's start with the viral posts. Chrissy Teigen and others shared this message claiming the U.S. Postal Service is telling Americans to give 14 days travel time for mail-in ballots to be counted. Quote, election day is not November 3rd. Election day is Tuesday, October 20th. To see if this claim was true, we went straight to the United States Postal Service. They pointed out that different states have different due dates for mail-in ballots. Most say ballots need to be received by the end of election day, November 3rd. Others, like Illinois and North Carolina, only require postmarks by election election day and then others like Louisiana actually require ballots to be received the day before election day. Now sites like USA.gov and vote.org have specific dates for each state. The USPS told us they quote recommend that domestic non-military voters mail their ballots at least one week prior to their state's due date. That's seven days not 14. So is the claim correct? Do I have to send my ballot 
14 days before that due date. No, this claim is false. A reminder, you can also drop the ballots off in person at your election office. The South Florida coast is prepping for that hurricane that Chris has been tracking for us. And there is an added complication. The state is still dealing with a high number of COVID-19 cases. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone with more on how it might affect the response. In Florida, the clock is ticking. They just signed an executive order uh, to declare a state of emergency in every coastal county of Florida's east coast. Hurricane Isaias is on the way, now projected to skirt the entire length of the Sunshine State's east coast, but where experts know a change in that track by just a few miles west can turn a gentle storm into a major disaster. As a mayor, I lose sleep over flooding. In Florida's coastal cities, people are wasting no time preparing for this storm and the peak of hurricane season yet to come. I think people are really trying to get ready in case something happens. Isaias caused flooding across Puerto Rico Thursday as a tropical storm. It strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane just before midnight after spending days as a disorganized system out at sea. The problem with this storm is there's only two days notification. Most have a week. As one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots, a major hurricane could pose a dual threat both to public health and homes and businesses. State COVID-19 testing centers have been temporarily shut down. The situation remains fluid and can change quickly. Hurricane season during a global pandemic, a test of wills and of the government's ability to keep people safe. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You know, we've been busy tonight tracking a few showers and storms that have been moving through. It's been mainly dry around Metro Atlanta, but we've had some showers over on the west side, and then it got pretty active in North Georgia and to the north and east of us during the evening hours tonight. And we still have a few lingering showers right there on the Georgia South Carolina line. If you're going up 85 north, up into parts of Hart County, uh, right here near near Hartwell, also into Stevens County near Tacoa, also right there in parts of Franklin County. We still have some lightning left behind. A lot of this is crossing over the state line into South Carolina, where we have about 32 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. That's headed right toward the Clemson area at this hour with some of that uh, thunder and lightning. And it was pretty active in North Georgia earlier. A lot of that has moved into North Carolina. We're quiet here in Atlanta. We were tracking some showers coming in from Alabama, just causing a few light sprinkles really in parts of Polk County over into Floyd County and DeBarto County. But that is all falling apart right now. We're still waiting for the latest advisory. We expect this to come in any moment now from the National Hurricane Center on Hurricane Isaias. Here we have the storm right now over the central Bahamas. Maximum sustained winds uh, right at about 80 miles an hour, and we're going to be watching this storm that's going to be moving in here uh, along the Florida coast as we go through the weekend. So here's the category one storm right now that'll keep moving up toward Florida during the day tomorrow. It's pretty much going to be in the Bahamas and then nearing the Florida coast uh, later on Saturday as the system moves on through and then it's just kind of scouring the coast here moving up throughout the day on Saturday and into Sunday as well. And then Monday is the time frame when we really think that it's going to be curving just away from the Georgia coast as a tropical storm, but close enough to bring in some rough surf and some wind there along the Georgia coast. We still think we'll, we'll be on the quiet side of this system, and I really don't expect any major issues with this here in our area. Maybe just a slight increase in our rain chances for your Tuesday, actually for your Monday. Uh, and then that's going to be higher though rain chances over to the east of us. There's another system we're watching. This is a, a tropical depression. Sorry, that's kind of jumbled up there. This just came in. I haven't had a chance to edit that here. Uh, this is an area of low pressure. Earlier, they were thinking the weather service or the hurricane center was thinking this could become a tropical storm, but I don't think that's going to happen now. And it's way off the coast of Africa. No real impacts for us. 92 for a high today. Our average high for this time of year is 89. So yeah, we were above the average. No rain in, a, in a Officially at Hartsfield Jackson, our surplus is right now is about just under 11 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. We're going to have lower rain chances for the weekend. How about that? But it is going to be getting hotter and we will continue to track Isaias as it uh, moves closer to the Florida coast through the weekend. 20% chance for a shower tomorrow, 30% chance Sunday, and then a little higher rain chance on Monday. And of course, that depends on the, uh, the track of Isaias. And then lower rain chances Tuesday, only a 20% chance Wednesday and Thursday. These are difficult times in Major League Baseball with more players 
testing positive and some stern words from the commissioner. ESPN reporting that Rob Manfred is warning the league may shut down for the season if it doesn't do a better job of managing the virus. Two St. Louis Cardinals tested positive on Friday and more than a dozen Florida Marlins in the past week. For now, the games go on, and that includes the Braves home with the Mets on Friday night. It was a wild game. The Braves trail 10-6 in the bottom of the eighth, but here comes the rally two on for Dansby Swanson, who has been an RBI machine so far. He brings home a run to make it 10-7. Then the Mets bullpen falls apart, and a wild pitch allows Enciarte to score to make it 10-8. Bases loaded, two outs for Travis Darno, and he comes through clears the bases with a double a five run eighth inning Darno with five RBI on the night Braves win 11 to 10 three straight wins now in this shortened season another great moment at Georgia Tech football practice head coach uh, Jeff Collins awarding a scholarship to a senior a former walk on zero scholarship offers came here as a walk on and earned the number zero and earn a scholarship in this program. Jamin Brooks! Yeah. Jamin Brooks is a defensive lineman from Sandersville. He has emerged as one of the leaders on the team and leaders in the tech program get single digit jerseys. This will be the first year college players can wear the zero. That will be fun. Let's hope the season rolls on. Big weekend of pro motorcycle racing in North Georgia. The annual stop at the Michelin Raceway Road, Atlanta. It runs all weekend with the headlining races Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Fans are allowed in, but they will use the CDC guidelines, including masks and social distancing. The raceway is on Winder Highway in, in uh, Brasselton, and it is a lot of fun. That's a, that's Road Atlanta is so cool. It's so much fun. And a local fighter will make his debut on the biggest mixed martial arts stage. Cody Durden trains with American Top Team Atlanta, but he has never fought in the big league, the UFC, before. And he gets his shot Saturday night as a late replacement. Durden is 29. He will face Chris Gutierrez in Las Vegas. The show will air on ESPN+. We'll take a break. We return right after this. Newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 
Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We're continuing to watch those rain chances going down as we head into the weekend as we're going to see a few scattered showers here. Only a 20% chance of that Saturday back up to a 40% chance on Sunday. Monday impacts from Isaias off the Georgia coast will be very minimal for us here. We're just bringing the rain chances up to 40%. I really think those chances will be higher as you go up or go to the eastern part of our state and closer to the coast. Tuesday, a 30% chance for showers, then just a 20% Wednesday and Thursday with highs in the upper 80s to near 90. Thank you, and thank you for watching. The weekend's here. Yippee. We are set and ready to, to sail off into Saturday and Sunday. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, check out 11 Alive right now. Up Late is up in about two minutes. Safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers. The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergency